Hello, guys. Welcome to another edition of the Sharpening Report. Uh, glad to be back with you guys tonight. This is Jake Rahutsky. And our guest tonight that I'm having on, we had him here at Skywatch recently. Really fascinating stuff. Talked about Obama's birth certificate uh, and a variety of other things. Carl Gallups is with us tonight. Carl, thank you for joining us tonight, man. Hey, Jake. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem, man. I'm really excited to talk to you tonight. So yeah, I had you on tonight, Carl, and we talked about this before. We're going to talk about several things, but one of the main topics we're going to discuss tonight is Freemasonry and witchcraft and infiltration into the American church and into to, uh, church religious groups um, in our country. And people have had close encounters with this type of stuff. I've had close encounters with some witches myself um, and people who I perceive to be uh, full of darkness and involved in this type of stuff, but it's real, man. Most people turn a blind eye to it, and I know they think this doesn't happen, but the reality is we're on a battlefield, and the enemy has his agents just as God has his agents as well. So yeah. why don't you go ahead and expound, Carl, upon some of your experiences in this um, topic, and we'll just have a conversation about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jake, first of all, you know, thanks for having me on. I really do yeah. appreciate it. And, and look, here's the deal. Um, I know these are sensational topics, I, 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 but I want your audience to know that um, I've been in the ministry for over 30 years. I've been the senior pastor of one church on the Gulf Coast down in Northwest Florida for 30 years. In just a couple wow. of weeks, I will have been in one church for 30 years. So I've been in one community in one church. It's a Southern Baptist church. It's a, a large church for our area. And, um, and, and so, uh, but when I went there 30 years ago, it was just kind of a rather small church. And, and um, so I've been through a lot. Prior to that, I spent 10 years in Florida law enforcement. Uh, with two different sheriff's offices and the Florida Department of uh, Corrections at the, at the state level, um, even at the administrative level. So a good 40 years of life experience. But right. to the topic at hand, yeah, 30 years in one community, 30 years in one church, mm -hmm. I have had some not only close encounters, I've had some very in-my-face, up-front, <laughs> uh, and, and, and head-on encounters with with the demonic realm and uh, attacks against me, um, uh, mm -hmm. other leadership in our church, our church as a whole, and then having to deal with that, not only at the local level, um, but I will also explain to your audience even at the national level. So I, I, I want your audience to understand, I do not claim to be an all-knowing expert on the topic of, of Freemasonry, for right. example. We're going to talk about that because that was one of the demonic attacks. I don't claim to be an all-knowing expert in, in, on the topic of witchcraft, right. but I have dealt with them both, and I have had to speak to them both, and I've had to deal with them both in a very real way within within my church ministry. So um, I don't know where to begin with this. Let me begin by speaking of a matter of, um, of what was identified to me as witchcraft. And here's how it started. Uh, a couple of years prior to the experience I'm going to relate to your audience, I had a gentleman in the community near the church where I pastored came to me one day for counseling. Now, I know I knew this guy and had been loosely related to his family through some ministry endeavors over the years. So I knew who he was, mm -hmm. and, but he came to me for a personal counseling appointment. I could tell he was very disconcerted and and um, um, seemed to be a little, little uh, afraid, actually. But we went into my office. We sat down. And to make a long story short, he told me that his wife was directly involved in witchcraft. She was involved in a witch coven and that mm -hmm. she had joined this organization with some relatives of hers as well as some good friends. And he was distraught about it and he wanted to know, you know, everything that I knew about it and how he should respond, et cetera. Well, it's a long story because of the man's right. own spiritual journey and other things that I knew that were happening in that family. But the bottom line is, so it was revealed to me that way that his wife was involved in a witch coven in our right. area. Then he went on to warn me that she would somehow be involved in coming against me 
and or my ministry. Mm -hmm. I didn't really understand that. And he wasn't claiming to be a prophet. Apparently these were just right. things he had heard. This was not a particularly godly man, by the way, but these were just things he had, apparently he had overheard some discussions or some braggadocious statements along those lines. Well, I went, I assured him I could deal with it if, and when that day came and, you know, et cetera. And I ministered to him personally, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to deal uh, with spiritual warfare and the demonic and how to you know, to uh, talk to his wife, et cetera. Okay. But I told that story so that when I tell the story of what happened, you and your audience will know why I called this an attack of, of, of possible witchcraft. Because what happened was we had had another situation in our church. Remember, I've been there for three decades, Jake. Yeah. So, so been through a lot of what I call, um, you, you, you know, in a lot of these, um, uh, Bible built, uh, small churches. Now that my church is no longer small now, but when I first went, right. they're usually kind of controlled by family groups. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can be a very godly thing. If it's a very godly family that the Lord has used to bring some borders and boundaries and some security, that's good. But sometimes it's based upon power groups and, you know, and who has the standing in the community and who, who right. runs the church. And that's very typical. And so I had already run into some of that, not only in the church I was pastoring, but in the community. Well, you know, being a, a former lawman, I mean, I, I wasn't particularly intimidated by by these people, but, right. but I was trying to minister. You know, I have a pastor's heart. I wanted to try to reconcile all of that and to try to bring some peace in those situations. I didn't come in to, uh, to, to be an antagonist. I didn't come in to further split the church. I, I wanted to try to bring some things together. So as it rocked along uh, for the first couple of years, things I thought were coming together. But then an attack against me, my leadership, my authority ensued, and it had to do with one of these families. I won't bore your listeners, uh, your, your, your viewers with all the details, but it did ensue against me and the church that I pastored and the leadership of our church. And so we dealt with it in a biblical manner. And actually, to make a long story short, we actually had to bring uh, a couple of people um, involved in all this before the church for the church to decide whether or not to remove their membership because they refused to reconcile. Mm -hmm. They refused to repent. They refused to stop the attacks on the leadership. So that hurtful situation, we, we dealt with it in a biblical way, prayerful way. Uh, God blessed and honored. Uh, the, 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 the meeting went through as it should have. And that man and uh, family left the church. All right. Now, I told that story because a few months after that, in a Sunday morning worship service, uh, and at the time we were in what was then our old sanctuary, our little small one we had begun with. And so we had gone to multiple worship services, getting ready to build the larger one that would seat five, 600 people. Um, and so we were still in the small sanctuary. We were in multiple services. And in the early morning service, which was packed in that day, um, there were two women that came into the worship service sitting together. And I can remember, it was been a long time ago, but they were, they were dressed um, in a way that drew attention to them. I can't remember if they were both all in black. I think they were from the best of my memory. And, and just had that look about them of being involved in the occult. You've seen people that would dress and make themselves up like that. Um, right, yeah. They didn't have they pointy little black gone, hats yeah. and brooms, you know, but they just, right. they just presented themselves that way. But the point is, I told all of that previous uh, story to get to this point. I knew who the two women were. It was the wife of that man who had come to me a couple of years prior. Mm-hmm and one of her relatives. And while we were in that worship service that morning, I can remember distinctly that I was preaching that particular morning, preaching on the blood of Jesus Christ redeems us from our sin, the cross, the purpose of Calvary's cross, the purpose of the shedding of the blood. I mean, it was one of those, what you'd call in old fashioned biblical circles, it was one of those bloody sermons, you know? Yeah. But, but I remember thinking as I'm preaching this, and I think it was an unction from God, that if these women were here to cause a disruption, this would certainly bring it about 
because mm-hmm. the demonic would not be able to stand one of those types of, of, right. of, of sermons. So sure enough, Jake, in the middle of the message that morning, these two women began to, to speak out while I'm preaching, began to yell out, scream out. I don't remember the exact words right now, but it mm-hmm. was something along the lines of, he's telling a lie. It's, what he's saying is a lie. He's a liar. I mean, mm-hmm. just so demonic, you know? So I'm preaching the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm preaching the salvation that's available to all at the foot of the cross. And I'm having these two women presenting themselves in a what I consider to be a demonic fashion, one of whom I knew her own husband had previously told me that she had joined a, a, a coven mm-hmm. and had heard her actually say that she uh, was going to be somehow involved in attacking me. And here she was yeah. sitting in the worship service calling me a liar in the middle of my sermon. Well, now this has been decades ago and you know church shootings and uh, were were much much uh, uh, I guess less frequent than we hear of them now. But me being a former police officer, that's one of the first things I thought of. And then they that's one of the first things I thought of. They stood up. Uh, several of my men kind of went down to the aisle and kind of got around them. I can remember addressing them as lovingly as I could at first, asking them mm-hmm. to please control themselves. I called them by their names because I knew them. I didn't know them intimately, but I knew them. I had been there for years now. And and they continued to scream and, and holler and, no, we're not going to sit down and we're not going to shut up. And so the men gathered around. I can remember giving instructions to some of the men of the church to go to the office and call the law enforcement, call the law and get them out there immediately. And I remember speaking to my congregation and having them to empty, to clear the building or in an orderly fashion in which mm-hmm. they, they obliged. <laughs> but, and, and my thought was that, you know, who knew that these women might not just reach in their pocketbooks and pull out a gun. I mean, you know, I mean, right. d- decades ago, I was already thinking that way of protecting the church. So anyway, they went outside Law enforcement showed up. We explained to the law enforcement what was going on. Um, they, I told them that I would sign warrants. They did arrest them because the women wouldn't leave. I mean, even when the cops showed up. And they were taken away to jail. Uh, they were later bonded out. They pled not guilty for the purpose of taking the church to court. They wanted to make a big media affair out of it. So the attack just continued. It went on and on. So, So some months later... The, the case actually went to trial in our little community back then. Our community is huge now, but back then it was a little community. And, and not only, I mean, media showed up, but we just had a bunch of people back at the church praying that God would just cover us and protect us. Not only did the, the jury find in our favor within minutes of deliberating, but the women were found guilty of disturbing the peace, disturbing a public worship service. They were fined. They were given uh, restraining orders to never set foot on the property again, et cetera, et cetera. Not only that, but the media didn't air a single word of it. There was not a thing written in the newspapers. There was nothing on television. I mean, there were television cameras in the courtroom. You know, one of those kinds of stories you would think that the media would have loved to have put that out. And I don't know if it was because it didn't end like they hoped it would end or, or just the total covering of God. But the, but the deal was is that, is that we were protected in that way. Now, here's the kicker to it. So during later on in a legal procedure that, that followed all of that, we were in some lawful depositions mm-hmm. and we were dealing with these two women And in the process of taking their depositions, the question was asked if this certain group of people that we had had to deal with some years before had been involved in them coming down to the church and doing what they did. And under oath, they said yes, that they had been paid to come and to disrupt the worship service. So anyway, I hope this story hasn't bored your viewers, but the point, the point of it all is that, Oh my gosh, it was a tangled web of demonic and witchcraft. And, and, and look at the spiritual warfare. Look how the Lord Mm -hmm. revealed to me a year or two before it happened, who would be involved and how they would be involved and what it was. I was up against revealed it to me by, 
her husband who was innocently revealing it to me because he had no idea yeah. that we would have to deal with these other things that would uh, then lead to them being involved and coming down and doing exactly what he told me that he heard his wife threatened that would, would eventually happen. So, so right. anyway, that, that was an amazing thing. I mean, can you imagine turning out an entire sanctuary full of people, calling the law, having people arrested in the middle of the service, going to court, going to trial, um, you know, the, their own family members attesting beforehand that they were involved in a witch coven and witchcraft and all right. the, 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 the evil things that went with that and, 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 and then enduring that process and, and having yeah. people in the community, you know, kind of raising their eyebrows like, what's going on out at that church? Well, we, well we're, just, we're just preaching the blood. We're standing in the word. We're not letting the evil powers uh, tr uh, manipulate us or 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 attack us as a church. We just stood yeah. up against it as the word of God tells us to. Well, and you know, this type of talk and exposing this type of stuff, the devil hates that as well. There was someone that actually just came in our chat room that was cursing us, you know, using very foul language. Uh that's a that's just the devils basically oh, yeah. being oh, yeah. stirred up. You know, you deal with this topic. But yeah, it's interesting though, man, because I've I've run into this before with people too and um, you know, the understanding that I have with different people I've talked to, I have not personally myself run into, say, a witch directly in a church. Now, I've perceived at times there were people operating under that spirit, maybe even unknowingly, because when someone gets out of um, when they start operating in a way contrary to the word of God, they can open themselves up to all kinds of stuff. You know, right. And well, people go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm sorry. You finish your thought. We have a no. little delay and I, I thought you were finished. Go ahead. No. So. um so what I've run into, though, is, um, you know, people that I perceived were operating out of different spirits, you know, basically as a result of the things that they've opened up in their life, whatever that may be. But the, the little bit of the research and stuff that I've done on it is that these groups do like to infiltrate churches and they do like to stay. They like to stay hidden uh, for the most part. They, they want to operate covertly, cause disruption, cause uh basically cause church divisions and stuff like that. And many of them at times have more power than the church does because the church is, um, the church is oblivious to, yeah. to the spiritual battle going on or the fact that anyone out there is even trying to do such things. And if you mention it, if you mention it, the person that mentions it is crazy. Not the fact that people are doing witchcraft is crazy. You're crazy for thinking it happens. It's wild, That's right. man. That's right. It's the wildest That's thing. No, you're absolutely right, Jake. And listen, let me just add to that and say, because I've been there for three decades in yeah. one community, in one church, I just told that story. But but prior to that happening, you know, I told you about all the stuff we went through. Yeah. After that came the Masonic attacks. Um, I'll talk about that in a few moments. Yeah. With that came more of what I discerned as witchcraft uh, mm -hmm. type of activities aimed at our church and leadership. But here's the thing. Um, how do I say this? I, I I really believe that one of the things that has made and still continues to make our church so sweet and powerful and so mm -hmm. used of God all over the world is the fact that years ago we were put to the test. I mean, I hadn't been there but a few years, and I had mm -hmm. started just with the typical pastor's heart of love and reconciliation. And I mean, listen, I still have that heart. I'm, I don't go out every day looking for a fight. I don't. But right. I do now go out every day understanding there will be a fight mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere yeah. along the way because it's spiritual and it's mm -hmm. wicked. Paul tells us that in Ephesians 6, our battles against powers and principalities and high places, heavenly realms, wickedness. And so I've experienced that in so many ways firsthand. But I can tell you that, that my experience of being in law enforcement for 10 mm -hmm. years prior, my gosh, at the state prison level, and the mm -hmm. demonic that went on in there. And then at the street level as an investigator, a patrol officer and two different sheriff's offices, one of them very large dealing in the, in the, in the drugs and the perversion and the, and, the, and the darkness that goes on with all of that in the criminal element. Brother, I came up, I mean, I've, I have arrested people that spoke in other languages and spoke in different voices. I mean, the demonic, just mm -hmm. as a law enforcement officer, but, but I was a believer in Christ. So I, I, I was able to discern. And, and then when I moved into the realm of pastoring, you're right. 
a lot of pastors just, I don't think, and I'm not being disparaging, but they don't know, they don't see this, or they've never dealt with it before. Most church members never have. But, you know, this is something I, in my ministry, I don't look for demons under every rock, Jake, and mm -hmm. I don't yes. preach on this every Sunday. We don't right. focus or major on this. We focus and major on Jesus, the gospel, mm -hmm. missions, evangelism, outreach, the issues of the day and the biblical, the prophetic times we live in, you know, how to deal with the, with the issues of evolution and homosexuality and gay marriage and all these different right. things that Christians are wanting to know what the Bible says. That's what we are. We're, the, we're a church. We stand on the word. We mm -hmm. preach the whole word. But, but our church has lived through some of this stuff, and they understand. They understand yeah. the viciousness, and and even after that story that I just told, um, we had many more attacks over the years. Now it didn't; they weren't quite as dramatic. We didn't have to turn out worship services and have people arrested. Right. But the leadership of the church, we had to begin kind of weeding things out over the years when because people would come and they would try to manipulate, and then they would threaten, you know, leadership. And then we realized what we were dealing with. And, and we just nipped it in the bud. I mean, you know, we either uh, were, were able to bring reconciliation or we told people, listen, you're going to need to leave. This church is, you, you can't stay here. Not if you're yeah. going to, to unleash this demonic uh, mm -hmm. filth upon us and the leadership. So, you know, and you're right. I mean, people would say, oh, well, you know, the leadership of that church is crazy. Not these people, you know. Right, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. it's not that it's crazy to be involved in witchcraft. It's crazy to think that there is witchcraft, or so, to confront it. And that's how that's how the devil operates. Is yeah. when you wake up as a believer and you become aware of the spiritual battle, you're going to come under a demonic assault. And when that happens, if you talk about it and you share truth with others, the tool that the devil uses is you are crazy, turns it back on you. And that, right. that's basically to force you to shut up. And that's right. Right. that most people do not get past beyond the point of sharing it with others and discussing the battles that they go through because the right. devil uses this trick of right. people, accu the accuser of the brethren coming in and saying you're crazy. Yes. When in reality, the truth is much more crazy. Yes. And yeah. Anyways. And listen, and listen, Jake, I'm convinced. Look, I don't know how it is in all the other denominations, evangelical denominations, but in Southern Baptist, the average lifespan of a of a pastor's ministry is about four, maybe five years. It used to be like two, wow. two and a half years. So it's gone up a little bit. But I'm convinced, not all, now please hear me, not all. Yes, I'm right. convinced a good chunk based upon my 30 something years of ministry mm -hmm. now and preaching all over the United States and in several other countries and continents, talking to pastors in other cultures, in other places of the world and all over the United States, I hear stories like this over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons why there's such a quick turnover among pastors is because these kinds of things happen. They're confronted with them, and either they don't know how to deal with it or they're terrified of it and or they do know what it is. They mm -hmm. know how to deal with it, but they can't get their church or their leadership to, to, to deal with it with them. They can't get the power structure of their church. Sometimes right. the power structure of their church is connected to the, to mm -hmm. the demonic, maybe through Masonic connections. We'll talk yeah. about that in a moment because, boy, that was a wide open thing that I dealt with even at the national level starting first in my church. But I'm convinced that that that's why there's just so much turnover and so much turmoil in so many churches, because wherever the kingdom of God sets up, mm -hmm. the kingdom of Satan is going to try to set up in the midst of it. Right. And, and, you, and, and just to interject real quick, you got right now Madonna and different people saying they're openly trying to curse Trump. You know, we'll get into these discussions later, but you have people in our society who are coming out and saying, look, I'm trying to curse you. I'm trying to destroy you. Yes. There's yeah. witches going on YouTube educating people how to hex and curse someone. And here's the yeah. thing. They always have a justification and a system of morals that they yeah. justify what they're doing is they are justified to do it because this person did this or this yeah. person did that. And they yeah. really think they're okay in doing what they're doing. It blows yeah. my mind. Oh, listen, Jake, I'm telling you, man, when, when I and the leadership around me, when we have stood up to rebellious demonic spirits in our midst, you know, working through people over the years, over the decades. So mm -hmm. this is not something that happens every week at our church. I mean, you right. know, yeah. just a, a handful of experiences right. in 30 years, but still it's enough that I've got stories to tell. But one of the things that, that, that I have recognized is the truth you just said. And that is 
so you deal with one of these rebellious spirits and they trash and lie and malign and attack and rebel and squeal and holler but they're always it's they're always blaming the fact that we took a biblical stand in other words they will literally say they don't use these words but their argument is you wouldn't let me practice my filth in your midst therefore you're being judgmental and right. therefore that's why i've attacked you i mean it's so demonic the thinking right. is so perverted and that comes from satan you're absolutely <laughs> right so yeah so i i i think in my case and i give all praise and glory to the mm -hmm. lord there's no there's no pretentiousness on my part no no uh, braggadociousness i'm just saying with complete humility I think one of the reasons I've been able to be there for 30 years with a powerful ministry is that is that we stood up and I had good men around me, women too, mm -hmm. but I mean the leadership of our church, right. good men who stood around me and, and their wives and the women of the church, good godly women with them and, and defended their pastor. As long as I stood in the word in a loving way, and mm -hmm. but yet firm, and they defended and they supported yeah. that gave me the ability to do what was right regardless of the of the price and very few pastors have that blessing very few pastors have I, that luxury i agree man the most common thing that i see in the church is the deacon possessed church yeah it is very yeah. hard to exercise you know yes um, yes brother i'm so blessed i've got a i've got deacons who actually deke I mean, yeah. they're amazing. I mean, they're like associate, they're like lay associate pastors. They're in the hospitals, they're in the nursing homes. Every time there's a tragedy or a death in our church, they're the first people there ministering mm -hmm. and representing the church and the pastoral staff. I do a lot of traveling. I'm blessed to be on TV Skywatch and Jim yeah. Baker show and TVN. And so I travel from coast to coast and I'm, and, and, and so when I'm gone, man, the deacons, I mean, it's like, like a whole team of pastors. They're just mm -hmm. there. And they not only do they do that, but again, as long as I'm standing in truth and righteousness, brother, they surround me with a wall of protection. They come to my defense. They come to the defense of mm -hmm. the leadership of the church. So that's an amazing thing. That's the biblical model. Right. And when the biblical model is being practiced by a church family, but you have to have integrity filled leadership now, Right. I mean, it works both ways. So if I was just some jerk that was out to just gratify myself all of these years, they would not be supporting me. But because they see me literally always looking for the betterment of the church, for the protection of the church, right. I don't ever ask them for anything for myself. They mm -hmm. see that. They see the integrity. They've watched it for decades. Yeah. And so they surround me and they protect me and they defend me. And that gives me the ability to stand right where I need to stand to confront the demonic and to lead yeah. the church in confronting it. And God has honored that. He's honored those people. He's honored our church. He's honored my ministry. And I think really, Jake, you know, people laugh at me sometimes and say, well, how did you go from being a cop to being a pastor? And my answer is, well, it's a God thing. I mean, I didn't just mm -hmm. wake up one day and decide to be a pastor. When the Lord called me into ministry, I didn't want to go in the ministry. I ran for that calling from that calling for two years. I was like a, a modern day Jonah, you know, mm -hmm. until I decided I didn't want to be fish food. And so I just went ahead and, right. and surrendered. But I think those 10 years of being a cop, being involved at that level and being inside the state prisons and mm -hmm. in death row and dealing with that and and then on the street and being shot at and actually having to return fire and dealing with the hardest of the hard at the street level and the nastiest of the nasty. I, I think God was preparing me that when I got up against those demonic spiritual battles in the church realm, that I would, number one, I would be able to recognize it. And number two, that I wouldn't automatically fear it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I say that because I'm not trying to make myself out to be Billy Bad Boy or some great big brave giant no, but, but that's never afraid you, of anything. But, right. But if you have the authority of Christ and if you're walking in Christ, we don't need to fear. That's right. Because that's the devil's tactic. He wants you to be afraid of witchcraft. He wants you to be afraid of these people. Exactly. In reality, greater is he that is in exactly. you than he that is in the world. And brother, however, that, the, the, that, the, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. You say, however, but, go ahead. What I was just going to say is, Paul said, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. One of the reasons I educate people on this topic is so that they can have their eyes open to what's going on in the spiritual realm and to, to discern and be able to detect 
when these spirits right. are operating. Because if you deal with everything, Carl, on a fleshly manner, and right. you deal with the individuals just as the people, and you don't deal with the spiritual attack resulting, you're you're going to lose every time because you're Absolutely. you're going to have to remove the people, and you'll never be able to deal with these spiritual root. And these spirits like to network; they like to get strongholds. They so we have to know basically how to defend ourselves against this to recognize when it's operating. And the bottom line is we have to put on the full armor of God. The, exactly. the armor is there for a reason, guys. The reason you need armor is there's fiery darts. And mm -hmm. if you don't think as a Christian you can get hurt, you're wrong. We yeah, have right. to go, go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah, and I was going to say, and think about what the armor is, Jake. It's, I'm just going to put it in common terms. It's integrity. It's truthfulness. It's righteousness. It's, you know, right living, living rightly. It doesn't mean perfect, but your heart has to be right. Like King David, God says he's a man after my own heart. Didn't mean he didn't mess up, but it meant that he would constantly come back to the Lord, seek right. God's face, seek God's heart, seek God's will. And God says, I can use a man or a woman like that. I can use a person like that. And so that's the spiritual armor, standing in truth, standing right. in prayer, standing in righteousness, being a person of integrity. You know, I tell young pastors all the time, look, you can't expect. Now watch this, Jake. This is how this works. I say to young pastors, I'm getting to be an old man now, and I've got a lot of experience, and I have a lot that I can give to young pastors. And I tell them, look, 30 years in one place, pastoring a church, I've never been accused of sexual impropriety, for example. Is it because I'm a perfect man with no temptations? No, it's not. It's from it's because from day one, my secretaries will tell you this, my staff will tell you this, my wife will tell you this. 30 years later, I still practice these things. I guard myself in dealings with people. I don't counsel women alone. I don't right. counsel children alone. I don't counsel, you know, I've got, we've got video cameras in our counseling rooms. We've got windows in our doors. Um, there's always somebody there. If I counsel in my home, my wife is here. If I counsel at the church, secretaries or staff are there. Um, people are watching me through the video cameras, all of these kinds of things. And, and so I tell young pastors, look, if you flirt around with uh, a sexual temptation. For example, mm -hmm. you, you get involved in counseling women alone and you, you know, you're just kind of flirting around with that, not doing anything, just right. kind of flirting around with it, flirting around with it, flirting around with it. Here's what's going to happen. Satan's going to set you up mm -hmm. and he's going to come against you with a network and whether or not you succumb doesn't matter because when the accusation is leveled, right. People will be inclined to believe it, and you will forfeit God's protection because you have flirted and flaunted with it for months or years. Does that make sense? But no, on the absolutely. other hand, biblically speaking, if you put on the armor and you protect yourself with integrity and righteousness and truthfulness, and you go the extra mile to demonstrate without being, look at me, look at me, but just demonstrate in your life that integrity. If the accusation does come, God will immediately come to your defense. He will immediately be your refuge. He will guard and he will protect because greater is he who's in us than he who is in the world. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And, well, I'm, tell uh, I'm telling you as a man that's, <laughs> that's been, you know, practiced it for 30 years, and that doesn't mean I can't fall tomorrow. I pray to God I don't. So I'm not trying yeah. to say I'm some giant of a of a man that that can never be tricked by Satan. I am not saying that. In I'm fact, just, the, in fact, the people that say that are the ones I worry about, man. Yeah, because that's you go. I knew a, I I knew a guy years ago that we had the conversation, and I just told him we have to be careful as men how we do things, you know, because David himself was was tempted and fell. And I said, as a man, we're not and you know we're not. Uh, impenetrable. And he looked at me and said, I would never do anything wrong in any situation. I would Ooh. never cheat on Ooh. my wife. And I looked at him and I said, you got a problem. <laughs> yeah, I was bro. like, because if you're that confident that yeah. you and yourself can stand up against anything, man, don't put yourself right. in those positions, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I think it's a better thing to say as such 
yes. that I do not desire. I do not want to. I pray to God. I never do. I pray he gives right. me strength. I will do all I can with God's help to ensure that, that I don't, but mm -hmm. to say I would never, or I will never. I mean, I, man, you just setting yourself up. I mean, Satan yeah. is going to target that and he's going to hone in on that. So anyway, anyway, just yeah, to get back to this conversation, Jake, I, I appreciate you letting me kind of spill my guts here, but I, sure. because I'm hoping there are pastors and leaders and churches and, 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 and young people who are a part of, of churches where the Lord is really moving and working. Please understand Satan's looking for a way to chink away at that. He'll, he's uh -huh. looking for a way to manipulate and use you, um, you know, to whoever's listening to this broadcast or watching this broadcast. Uh, and to pastors, I say, listen, you, you, you really have to put on the armor, guard your integrity, get prayer warriors around you. Be careful how you present yourself in areas of temptation. What are those areas of temptation? Sex and money and power, right? Right. Yes. right? Sex and money and power. I mean, there, there may be other temptations for other people, but those are the big it's, ones. It's the three G's, the three G's of minister, gold, glory, and girls. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> yes. Sex, money, and power, gold, yeah. glory, and girls. And, and so, you know, I tell uh, pastors and leaders, ma males, especially but females as well, but I tell them, look, you've got to guard these areas because you know, who, who, who doesn't um, from time to time deal with a thought of lust? Who doesn't from time to time deal with the thought of riches? Who doesn't from time to time person, deal, yeah. Yeah, deal with the thought of, of a little more authority, a little more power, a little more glory that goes, you know, of course, if, you know, we're going to have those assaults come against us. So, so, you know, I, I tell I tell pastors now, because you're in the ministry and because you're a pastor, not only does not make you immune from attack, mm -hmm. but it makes you a bigger target of attack right. because you have set yourself up as the spiritual leader, if you will. And if mm -hmm. Satan can bring you down, you can bring yeah. a whole lot of people down with you. And how yeah. many times have we seen that happen? So oh, too, we need, too many we need, times, man. Yeah, we need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and that's that's what it means. It doesn't mean we Amen. have to work for our salvation, but work it out. Pump the you know pump in the iron. Work it out. Work through the dynamics of of our day to day walk in the Lord. We are saved, but mm -hmm. work out those dynamics humbly and fearfully relying upon the Lord and his protection because we're living in very prophetic times, Jake. We're living in very spiritual times right. and, and the demonic are screaming and uh, the powers that be are now not just relegated to the local church, but they're relegated to the halls of government and they're relegated to world powers, world organizations, world authorities. I mean, it's coming down to the wire and Satan yeah. knows his time is short. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, and he is filled with rage, Jake. Absolutely. You see that coming out in the streets. You see, I mean, people, it's just, uh, it's not just politics anymore, man. It's like darkness and light. And I'm not saying if you're a Republican, you're light. And if you're a Democrat, you're dark. What I'm saying no. is if you support abortion, if you support, you know, all these things, if you support uh, different sexual identities and all these different things that are contrary to the word of God, you're walking in darkness. That's right. And, the, and the political party, if you want, but I'm addressing the issues, you know? Yeah, no, no, no. You, you and I don't throw it in a political party because those kinds of things cross party lines. And you exactly. and I know that. Yes. No, there are people with an R beside their name, you know, that are involved in sexual perversion and or mm -hmm. support sexual perversion or gay marriage or even abortion. Uh, there mm -hmm. are people with a D beside their name that do not support those things. So, so all of that, all of that crosses party lines. Generally speaking, the platform of the two right. parties. Generally speaking, the the Democrats tend to lean way more towards supporting abortion and gay marriage and all of those things, whereas the Republicans, generally speaking, don't. But Again, it's not an issue of political party. It's an right. issue of the human heart and whether you're right with God through Jesus Christ. That's but the issue. I, I will say the fact alone that Trump has defunded Planned Parenthood, that is one of the greatest victories in the last decade, in my opinion. That is amazing. The fact that he's willing to go that route, and this isn't saying we're getting rid of abortion, but we're getting rid of the taxpayers. You and me, 
today are we're supporting abortion by our taxes right. against our will. Right. And he's taking care of this issue because Planned Parenthood is not about prenatal care. They will right. say it is. They've claimed it is, but they don't provide prenatal care. It's about killing babies, essentially. No, you're you're absolutely right. And how how demonic and how perverse is that? You know, especially especially when 98, 99% of, of abortions are done for matters of convenience. Mm -hmm. You know, we can argue about the other one to 2% and you know, that those arguments will go on until the Lord comes back about rape and incest. And, and they'll, they'll the stand on those. Like that's the 99%. I know, yeah. I know but it's not. And, 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 I, and I know some people say, well, I don't want to compromise on any of it. I get that, but we're not talking about the fine details right now. We're just talking about this Holocaust that's before mm -hmm. us that prior to Donald Trump, no presidential politician in my lifetime, Democrat or Republican or independent or, or uh, uh, libertarian has ever dared to make their platform. If you'll elect me, I'll eliminate this scourge. I, I you know, I, I don't know. I mean, not, not any real front runner. I mean, yeah. Donald Trump was a front runner and he was holding to that, even though he was catching all of the gates of hell against him for it. He held right to it, and within his first week, he started signing executive orders uh, to begin to dismantle that process. Still a lot of work to be done and some Supreme Court decisions to be overturned, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, um, maybe some laws, some congressional laws passed, but um, well, the and fact I, that he would even undertake it and is, is, am is an amazing thing, and I praise God for it. Well, and I understand he's he wants to make some changes in the 501c3 status of churches where they have the ability to speak out more in the arena of politics yeah. in the yeah. political realm, which I think is valuable. But honestly, Carl, I think, um, I think basically, um, one of the biggest, pro one, another problem in the church today is we've become too dependent upon the 501c3 tax break where it's almost kind of like a sellout essentially. And I'm not saying it's a deliberate thing. We've grown up into this, right? Churches have been doing this for a long time. Yeah. But we've gotten so addicted to the tax break that it's kind of hindered our ability to speak out. Right. Well, let me give you some insight on that, Jake. Again, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm an older man now, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I've been doing this a long time. And let me just say to pastors that are listening, regardless of what happens with the 501c3, here's the truth of the matter. Um, to have a, 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 tax deduction on a church is really a safeguard of the, our first amendment right in that in that whatever the government can tax it can literally tax out of existence if you want it to but if it can't tax it then there is a level of control that it cannot have um and I've come up against this firsthand in my community for 30 years, dealing with they're trying to level levy a fees against churches and, you know, little little taxes and fees. And, and I've stood up against them all and said, no, you, you can't do that. If you can levy a fee against the church, if we don't pay the fee, what happens? And I literally had a county official tell me, well, if you don't pay it, then we'll close the church down. And I said, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. The First Amendment says the government can't close a church down. But that's why tax exemption is a good thing. However, the 501c3, the caveat in there, and what most pastors and church leaders don't know is the only real caveat. And you can go to the government website, the IRS website, read the 501c3 regulations. That's only about four paragraphs. It doesn't take you uh -huh. 15 minutes to read it. It's not that complex. But basically what it says is that a church cannot use its church facilities in a worship service to take up a collection to give to a singular political candidate and support and endorse a singular political candidate as a tax exempt organization, because it's not fair that you're basically, you're basically laundering money through a tax exempt organization when you're nothing more than a political action committee. So I'm going to tell you, Jake, I get that. I understand that, but I'm going to tell you what 501c3 does not prohibit. And this is amazing because Either pastors don't know this, or they're using the fact that the people don't know it as an excuse for not preaching the Word of God and, and addressing the issues of the day. Again, for 30 years, I've been addressing 
I've been on TV. I've been on Skywatch. I mean, I was helping to investigate the president's birth certificate for all right. things. We're a 501c3 tax exempt church and have been ever since I've been there. Doesn't mm -hmm. prohibit me from doing that. 501c3 doesn't address speaking out to issues. We can even give to issues. We can give money to right. issues. Our county was dealing with a wet dry referendum. We gave money. We were the largest single uh, giver of finances to keeping the county dry. I was involved. I was speaking at rallies. I was standing on the corners holding signs. I mean, I was a political activist in a mm -hmm. 501c3. Never a problem with that. And we've even had political um, uh, rallies at our church, not during right. the worship service. I would never do that on a Sunday morning worship service anyway. But later on that night, maybe we would have a, where the candidates for office would come to the church. They would each give speeches and stuff. Um, and we would advertise it to the community. Nothing wrong, 501c3, as long as you invite all of the candidates. I can't right. just say, look, we're going to support Jake for county yeah. commissioner and Jake alone, and we're going to use the finances of this church to do it. And if you'll give your money to Jake, you can get a tax deduction right. as well. You see, that's what 501c3 is about. It has nothing to do with preaching the word, with standing against abortion or right. gay marriage or, or you know, even a corrupt administration. Nothing to do with that. So and I, I guess what I'm getting down to, uh, Carl, is that um, the pressures from the non-believers in the world and the misinterpretation of the law has forced pastors into basically staying silent on a lot of issues they could speak out about. Well, perhaps. I don't know. Yes. I would use the word forced. I think fooled or cajoled. Right, yes. Uh, because, for example, I've been doing it for 30 years. Nobody's forced me into anything. I knew what the law was, so I just kept the law right. and just gotcha. did what I was supposed to do. So right. I think some pastors just don't know. Mm -hmm. Other pastors, and and you know, but they need to know. That's why we're telling them this tonight. Um, other pastors do know, but they don't want to deal with those issues because they're afraid they'll make somebody mad. People right. leave the church. They'll take their money. They can't pay for their buildings. So they'll say, you know what, folks, 501c3, I can't talk about that stuff anyway. You know, let's just uh -huh. preach to loving, yeah. loving Jesus. Let's, you know, <laughs> and, and so then right. you get the little watered down devotionettes and, and the church is sitting out there starving for real life application of the word of God right. to their daily living. So anyway, I know you didn't bring me on here for this, but no, I could, that's okay. We, we touched on the issue and I obviously hit a hot point for you that you're passionate about. And that's great, man. And I, people do need to be educated on that. What, what they can and cannot do as a church. I'm not a pastor. I never have been. Yeah. So I'm I'm probably less aware than some of the others. I've just seen what I hear in church. Oh yeah. What I've heard pastors say. Oh yeah. So, Me again, too. And what the true motives behind that are. Again, you might be right. They may just be yeah. dealing with the fact that they're worried about scaring people off. And it is oh, yeah. it's a fear that pastors have, man. Well, it's like well, instead of speaking the truth or speaking what you know to be true, you're gonna hold back for fear of what your people might think. How it, to me, it's just so twisted and I've never been under the pressure of being a pastor. I'll just say that, but it's just, it let's pick truth or let's pick uh, what's popular, you know, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Well, let me just say in my, not this last book that I've written, but in the one before that I've written five books, the Lord's really blessed me. And, and, uh, but the one prior to my last one is called be thou prepared equipping the church for persecution in times of trouble mm -hmm. and in that book i have a whole chapter dedicated to this this understanding that that uh uh, uh pew research poll and george barna research poll they took years of polling conservative evangelical pastors in america thousands of them in fact george barna did the most most uh, uh extensive survey thousands upon thousands of conservative evangelical pastors and he asked them in anonymous polling about abortion and gay marriage and evolution and and you know in israel and the middle east and and palestine and all these hot point issues these political issues and he asked them how many of you conservative evangelical pastors out of thousands of you how many of you preach on these topics here was the startling result. It took him years to, to put this together, and I've got it all documented in my book. He said, out of those thousands of conservative, not the liberals, but the conservative evangelical pastors, over 90% of them said, we never address any of those issues ever from our pulpits. Mm -hmm. 
And then when he asked them why, they said, and this was the number one reason. They had other reasons, but the number one reason, number three or four on the list was 501c3 when you asked them anonymously. Number one was, we'll make somebody mad, they'll leave the church, they'll take the money, and we can't pay for our buildings. I'm telling you, brother. What's it wrong is, with it, our system, man? Well, <laughs> and so and so, what happens then, Jake? That means less than ten percent of conservative evangelical churches are out there doing what our church is doing, and others. There are another, you know, ten percent with us. So I'm not saying I'm the only one. I've never said that. Never thought that. I don't want to get the Elijah complex. You know, he said, "Lord, I'm the only one," and God said, "Shut right. up, boy. I got seven thousand yeah. like you." Just, but but I'm saying, but ninety percent of them. Don't, according to their own confession, their own admission. Mm -hmm. And that's in America, Jake, with a First Amendment protection. And a 501c3, really a protection that all it says is you can't take a singular candidate and act like a political action committee, a money laundering, yeah. tax-free organization for a singular candidate. But other than that, you can preach the issues. You can address right. the issues. You can even raise money to fight the issues. It says that in the tax code, but well, and it, they it, don't do it. it. It makes me believe, man, that maybe we've got too expensive buildings sometimes, you know? Absolutely. A, ch a church needs a building, but if you're that tied up with money that you've got to fund this massive burden, yep. maybe we're going about it the wrong way. You know, yep. I led my, yeah, go ahead. Go I'm sorry. No, I'm I was so just going to say, I think the house church is going to come back in the last days big time Yeah, it because be. it's conventional and it's practical. You know, when yeah. persecution comes and when a lot of these big churches fall through, the house church will come back because that is the true definition of yeah. how the church started going from house to house. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a big church. There's not. It's just, right. it's not the most conventional way to do things. Go ahead, Carl. Yeah. I, I, yeah. And I apologize for interrupting. We've had no, just you're a fine. light delay and you and I both are just, we've been, we're engaged Passionate. in a conversation Fire here. Yeah. And, yeah. and so we're stepping on each other and I'm so sorry, but the bottom line is, um, I, um, the church that I pastor, I led them many years ago into being debt free, totally debt free. And, wow. and, and we are, and we have been, as I said, for many years. And that brings a lot of freedom as well. Now, mm -hmm. I don't consider debt when you borrow money to do something that you know you can pay back and that it doesn't strap your budget. But I know church, and, but we don't even have that in our church. But, right. but I know churches that have borrowed to build these big fancy buildings and they're into the millions and millions of dollars, which is tens and tens of thousands of dollars a month in payments right. for 30 years over and above their regular weekly needs. I mean, that mm -hmm. kind that's debt brother that will, yeah. that will destroy you and it will cause preachers to be very careful what they preach because mm -hmm. they don't want anybody to leave who might take their money. I mean, it's a sick cycle. It's a yeah. horrible cycle. But it's there, and over 90% of America's conservative evangelical pastors admitted this to these pollsters and to George Barna. And I've got it all documented, like I said, in my book, so I'm not just you know, pulling this out of my back pocket. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. And, and, and listen, it goes right back to our initial conversation, to the demonic attack, to mm -hmm. the deception of the demonic world, to the lies, the twisting of truth for the purpose of shutting down the gospel, pulling away the strength and the courage of pastors and church leaders and, and relegating. Satan doesn't mind if we have a church on every corner, no. as long as we're not addressing the culture, as long as we're not being the salt right. and the light. He doesn't care. He wants the church to be a building, to be the four walls, and then the yeah. church goes out into the world and, and goes covert. He's exactly. fine with church going on behind the four walls as long exactly. as it stays there. Yeah. yeah. If the church gathers, sings a few little pretty songs and listens mm -hmm. to a devotion, and then everybody goes back to their sin and corruption and, you know, and deceit, Satan's fine with that, you know? But if a church is reaching the world for Christ, engaging its finances and mm -hmm. resources in, in missions and evangelism and addressing the issues of the culture and the day and, and using, you know, social media and television and radio and internet and, mm -hmm. and, and every resource a church might have. If a church is doing that, that's the church that Satan hates. That's the Amen. one he'll come against. Amen. Well, we've gotten a little bit off topic here tonight, Carl. We've talked, I mean, we've yeah. talked about a lot of great things, but man, I appreciate you coming on. Why don't you go ahead and share with people 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about your latest book and then where people can find all your information. Thanks, Jake. And yeah, we have, but I've, I've enjoyed this. Yeah, that's great. You, you can find out everything about me at carlgallops.com. That's my name, C-A-R-L-G-A-L-L-U-P-S, carlgallops.com. And that is a site. Be prepared to stay for hours if you have any desire to click around at all. There are thousands of videos and articles and links and links to our a huge uh, network and YouTube sites and Facebook pages. And it just goes on and on and on. Plus there's links to my church You can find all my books there. You can find my books on Amazon, but carlgallops.com is the place to start. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of videos archived on that page on a YouTube like channel that's on my own server. So it's nice, nice and clean and crisp. Uh, or you can click over to our YouTube. We've got two YouTube sites that are viral. And uh, in fact, one of them has, I don't know, 60, 70 million views and 70,000 subscribers. Wow. And yeah, so you can go there. Um, so it's all at carlgallops.com. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me tonight, Carl. I'd love to have you back sometime. And I look forward to the next time we see you uh, here in Crane. But uh God Thanks. bless you, brother, guys. Until next time, this has been uh, the Sharpening Report. Thank you, Jake.